Right, well, thank you very much. I'm actually going to do two presentations, one on behalf of John Barnett on the archaeological side, and then the other one on the geological side that was my remit of Ecton. I guess that I'm doing these all right, we were a partner in the project, but we, we own the mine, and I'm perhaps doing this more from the user's point of view rather than the UNEXP in development point of view. And in both cases, these talks are really giving you a flavour rather than a lot of detail. I haven't got time to go into a lot of detail. As we mentioned this morning, the, um, the mine was flooded by 1860, so it's been flooded for 170 years. We know the bit above water level quite well. The bit below water level, there are no plans. We have one section that may or may not be very accurate from the mid 1800s, and that's it there. And you'll see this a couple of times with a few things annotated as I go through. Um, the dives at Ecton in May were 10 in total down three or two shafts and one pipe working, and we perhaps explored 10%, probably less than 10% of the accessible workings. Um, and that gives a, an indication of where they are. How they fit into that section, which they do seem to do, and the bits that have been filled by the miners with rubble. That is a point out in of one kind or another, I guess, of the, the robot. You can actually see the robot in the centre, the little purple blob, uh, in, in the pipe workings, which are something like 45 metres across, 20 metres high at this point. So really, quite substantial openings. To give you a bit of an idea, that data wouldn't have been good enough to, to do a detailed geological evaluation. We learned that, the, as we expected really, that the, the pipe workings actually connect to both shafts and that gives a plan view of what we now know to be how they connect from, from, the, from the water surface to the three locations. We also know those water workings go on deeper, but we have not um, explored them yet. That is the data for the workings, and I think we saw that in the previous presentation too. Uh, gives an idea of the pipe down to a depth of about, um, I think it's just short of 60 metres, from where the pipe comes out to, to, to water surface and to where it connects through to what was the winding shaft in the mine. We also uh, were able to get glimpses of where there are other tunnels going off from the, from the workings and what John called side pipes. So these are small workings that were accessed from the shaft, comparatively small workings, and in, in the case of Ecton, they're actually for an old mine quite big. And we have an example of one there. Um, it's really just looking into a, a big space which possibly goes through to something. We also learn a lot about um, how the shafts were connected to each other, how the, the workings were developed, which was information we didn't have because, as I said, there were no plans. There was that one very crude section. And a little bit about how those uh, openings have survived or not survived. Perhaps in this case, it's either been backfilled or collapsed at the back there over the last 150 years, or perhaps a bit longer, because this part of the mine was probably worked in the 1760s. There are some archaeological remains in place. There are substantial timbers, and this, this timber here is actually visible from the surface from the launch site. But it's one of the timbers that divided the shaft up into a, the, 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 the section of the shaft where the, the pipes and the, the pumping system were the centre part where the haulage way was for the equipment and uh, probably the other side would have been similarly divided for a ladder way. These timbers actually form a bit of an obstacle for, for exploring the workings. They've been there for probably at least 200 years. In this particular case, uh, the bent looking timbers leaning across the shaft, so it's something that uh, the robot would uh, maybe encounter and uh, get stuck behind or beyond. But it's also useful to know that they're there from an exploration point of view, that they're holding up, in this case, a lot of, lot of rock. And once you start to dewater that, it's probably all going to start to slide down the shaft. And that's a, a view of the underside. 
We learned quite a lot about the archaeology of the mine, uh, and one of the um, recorded bits of information we have is that there was an underground canal about 60 metres below current water level that was used for hauling ore. And this is uh, a dam of some kind. It's clearly lots of probably like or super, super, presumably limestone, but they've been mortar together with what looks like clay and that might well have been to retain the water in this canal level. We don't actually know and we need to do more exploration to find out. It's a fairly good assumption and it's at the right depth. We had, um, as I say, some, some interesting views of some small side pipes. We had some, what I would say, tantalising views into some very big openings at depth all the way down to the bottom of the shaft. So this, the blue bits on that uh, diagram show where these are and where they might be going. We, all we know is that they're, they're big, maybe 50 metres or more uh, across and potentially going down. And um, in my talk, I'll come on to those perhaps a bit more. We know that there are various archaeological remains. Uh, in this case, it's probably some bits of collapsed timber from somewhere. The circular steel um, steel uh, object. We don't really know what that is, whether it's something that's been thrown down the shaft since the mine closed and just happened to lodge there or was left by the miners, but it is there. And we also saw, I haven't got pictures, things like pens that some of our school visitors have dropped down the shaft or little chemical light sticks that have, have sunk to the bottom, which are useful for giving a bit of scale sometimes. Um, and this is a view into one of these sort of side openings with some, some bits of archaeological iron work remaining on the top of the surface there. So I'm going to move on to the geology, which is more my specialisation. I am a, a mining geologist, and if anyone's interested, that's my background. I did 25 odd years for the British Geological Survey, mainly on late deep disposal of radioactive waste. So the geology in Epton, it's um, a mine situated in Ecton Hill, in the, it's a peak, it's a, the Peak District, um, Central England is a national park. The site itself is a scheduled ancient monument and a site of special scientific interest. So those are things that mean that we are very restricted in what we can do. And to do almost anything we need special, that would change the mine, we need special permission. Um, it's a Mississippi Valley um, Type of this on that side. So this is a valley type deposit of copper with some lead and zinc. It's in carboniferous or in ancient limestones, and there are four main divisions recognised in the vicinity. And I'm pretty sure from the uh, exploration of Ecton that we have been in the two middle ones of these. So as I said, it's a Mississippi Valley type deposit. Unlike most of the deposits in the area, it is not a typical vein type mineralisation. It's what's uh, referred to as a pipe. But in the Peak District, there are a lot of pipes that are near horizontal that are, are old cave system. This one is near vertical, so it's a little bit different. There's another one 500 metres away to the, roughly to the south, and another one perhaps a kilometre away to the west. So it, it's not alone, there are other pipes. I suspect more that have not been discovered. But there are three types of um, ore deposits within, uh, recorded within Ecton. What they called loads, which are typical uh, cavity field mineral veins. What they call saddles, which are mineralized limbs and fold related structures. And the pipe, which is actually not a single feature, it's a, a branching feature with lots of branches. Uh, that, that extend away from the pipe and then perhaps come in and join. So uh, I'm going to go through a series of images to show, and some of these, these you might well have seen already today, to show some of the geology. They're not selected because they're the best ones from the videos, they are just selected because they show features that I wanted to, to highlight today. I looked at all the videos from all the cameras from the dive at and I can tell you it's a lot of hours of, of video, even at twice speed. Um, but the first, the top, um, top left image shows 
the, the, the top shaft part of um, the pumping shaft and the winding shaft is similar that we have something like 40, 45 metres of near vertical, fairly thickly bedded limestone, which was something we didn't know before we had the dyes. And that below this, we then get into more thinly bedded, probably quite shady limestones that are often less steeply bedded and quite often folded and folded and milled. We'll come on to some of that in a minute. We were able to observe things like uh, chirp bands. And you can see the sort of the, the black band going across the roof, in this case, in this side passage between the two shafts. That's a chirp, so that's a silicious deposit and that allows um, mapping of the, the structure to a degree. Ecton is well known for its, its folding and that occurs at a lot of scales. It occurs on a large scale but it also occurs on a small scale. And here we have uh, images. Uh, the top one is a, a synclinal fold, possibly, uh, possibly with a bit of a fault down the, the axis. The, uh, the one below that is more contorted bedding in S-shaped bedding in the more thinly bedded limestones, and then the composite image is a that um, Steve put together is a rather complex triangle fold that might well have been refolded as well. So there's more probably, almost certainly, more than one phase of folding. There's an evidence for a lot of small-scale faulting, uh, and this is one such case and you will see there is a fault running diagonally through the picture and it's offsetting the calcite vein maybe by only 40 centimetres not by very much but it's evidence that this is quite a tectonically in some ways active area. Gorat mentioned the calcite veins um, we knew about the calcite veins they're an early phase of the mineralisation ectum they are certainly a form of hydrofracking, but one thing I hadn't realised until I saw images like this is that there are multiple phases of veining, and I think you'll find if you start to study that picture, there are three, at least three phases of fracturing and calcite veining filling, um, and that's all before any of the metals arrived in the area, and maybe in some cases before some of the folding. It's a copper mine. Uh, and one thing we didn't really find was any mineralisation underwater. Um, the left hand image. Oh, that's gone. Right, the, left, the, the top left hand image has um, some rusty brown patches. They are almost certainly count pyrite that is over the 250 years or whatever have been exposed to either for a long time air and then water corroded to a, an iron limonitic uh, material. But the other side is uh, the bottom of um, the pumping shaft, the, the blockage at the bo bottom of the pumping shaft, and the enlargement below is, I think, the only bit of secondary malachite staining that we found in all of the underground exploration. So there's, there's one or two bits that might be, but that's the only bit that's clear. So they're all right, it was a mine but there's very little mineralisation left down there. I mentioned that there were some big openings. These don't sharp at all well because they're so big, but you've got a vague idea that there's something big going on there. And the same here. So, as I said, tantalising glimpses of what's down there that we have yet, one way or another, to explore. And this one is at 100 metres depth, so it's never going to be explored by um, divers and a, a message uh, train. And then another one of Steve's composite shows uh, one of these side pipes at a higher elevation. That's about five metres high. Um, has um, some rocks at the bottom, so uh, useful information. And then uh, this is one of the folds that's clearly had activities by the miners. They probably extracted ore around here, and this might be one of these so-called saddles, which might be a fairly unique um, type of mineralisation, although probably not a particularly important one in my view, I think maybe a minor bit that they were working late on in the history of the mine. I want to summarise with a, a few conclusions about what we actually learned. From the dives at um, Ecton, we have a, 
a fantastic set of data. It's a huge amount of data and it will take uh, an awful lot of time to go through it. There is scope for doing some very detailed structural analysis, especially once some of these other tools you heard about in the previous two tools become available and you start to be able to extract some of the information from point cloud data or more automatically than having to do it laboriously by visual examination. We knew that the, the, the geological structural history of the area was complex. It's been confirmed that it's probably more complex than we thought it was. As I mentioned, the hydrofracking, there's at least three phases of that. I suspect it may be four or possibly more in some cases. I also think miners knew that that hydrofracking was an indication that they were near a pipe and they were using it as a, an indicator. And that might be useful for um, future exploration, if anyone ever does it in the National Park. The pipe appears to have been mainly developed in thicker bedding limestone and not the thinner bedded shadier limestones at the bottom. This is sort of logically what you might expect, that that, that kind of limestone might have been a better host rock uh, and more favourable for the, for the mineralisation. But the mineralisation is also partly controlled by the structural geology, but it's probably also partly controlled, or maybe even mainly controlled, by that hydrofracking that went on at an early stage. One thing we learned that we, we didn't know was that the mine appears to have been thoroughly stripped as it was closed. The mine took a very long time to flood once they turned the, pipe, the, the pumps off and it seems that the mine has gradually worked their way up with the water following behind and stripping the walls back in case they missed any little bits of ore and dumping the waste rock on the floor but removing any ore, uh, which is probably why we find very little down there and why the shafts have not. So it'd be interesting to get into the pipe workings deeper down to see what's happening down there. We've only seen a small fraction of what's there. We have a huge amount of information and I think that there is scope and I'm sort of working on a couple of universities to, to try and encourage either undergraduate earth science or geology students or MSc students to, to take a geological structural interpretation of some of the data, maybe only the data from one camera from one dive, to get a start on a, ge a structural geological interpretation of what is below water. And that might be two or three years away yet, and I'm hoping that we'll have that. So that's a very quick scoop through, more from the user point of view than from the developer point of view.